Welcome to Crimson Ed Talks. My name is Jamie and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Crimson Education. And today it gives me great joy to be with one of the true legends of Crimson, Samil Singh. Samil's journey began in New Zealand uh, in Hamilton and he went through an amazing academic ride finishing head boy and ducks for the school at Hamilton Boys High School before getting into not one, not two, but five Ivy League schools and also Stanford. He chose Harvard, naturally, thank gosh. And then after that, you know, also was a premier scholar in New Zealand landed at Harvard that applied math and computer science and has gone on to a really exciting career at top hedge funds like Bridgewater and most recently been running a really cool AI company, having raised millions of venture capital from some of the top investors in the US and beyond. Alrighty, uh, without any more ado, Samil, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jamie. Good to be here. So I guess um, to get things started, can you tell us a little about what you were like in high school and if you know, 15-year-old Samil could imagine how all of this unfolded? I think from a young age, I felt like I wanted all the hard work that I was putting in at school to count for something. And I felt like, you know, where I was um, and sort of trajectories I had available to me, um, you know, locally, weren't really rewarding that kind of behavior. But at the same time, I had this drive to do very well, to, you know, try to be the best in my grade, try, you know, acquire these these amazing, you know, sort of achievements. Um, and, you know, it was only when I met you, frankly, that, you know, it sort of uh, gave me a solution to the problem that I was facing, which was, how can I make all this work count? How can I sort of, you know, advance myself in a way that's differentiated? And that that's really what drove me in the end. Um, you know, in truth, like my dad told me about Harvard when I was a kid, and I think that's re that really stuck in my head. And again, it, it never really felt possible until I, I met other people who had who had gone through that process and succeeded, and realized that my profile might uh, might be um, competitive in this process too. So yeah, that's that was sort of my psychology in high school, I'd say. Okay, and then I guess when you think about probably the culture around you in high school and your own ambition. Um, would you say that the relatively relaxed environment in Hamilton made you more ambitious or was it a drag on your ambition? How, how did that environment kind of affect you? I think it, it did make me more ambitious because I felt as though the trajectory that I would otherwise be on if I was not ambitious was not something that was appealing to me. Um, and, you know, that frightened me, frankly, you know, it, it caused some sort of um, you know, anxiety response, perhaps, or something like that. Um, and, you know, I really wanted to fight against that. And I knew that I had the ability to, um, though I didn't know what my strategy would be. I, I will say that I always had um, a set of really smart people who sort of felt similarly to me and, you know, were quite, you know, um, ambitious as well. And that that was very helpful to sort of um, surround myself with people like that, uh, you know, in Hamilton, despite the broader community, not really, um, you know, aspiring, let's say, to study overseas at, at, at top US colleges or anything like that. Now, I look back incredibly fondly on uh, your journey in high school. Uh, for me, it was, I think, hundreds of hours, uh, often online on my end at EST, between the hours of sort of like 11 p.m. and 2 to 3 a.m. Um, back you know, with you in New Zealand time. And really, uh, the journey was epic, seeing the evolution. From your perspective, I guess, what was the role that Crimson played in that evolution? And you know, how did that sort of unlock opportunity for you in a way that you know, perhaps your peers around you didn't have? Perhaps I'll break down to two sort of components. The first is Crimson gave me a vision and strategy that I could execute um, and, and and essentially like a, a pathway that uh, was realistic um, and and could get me into these these amazing colleges, which I really wanted to, uh, to get into. So just having that initial conviction was a really big deal for me. Um, and the way that Crimson built this was uh, by creating a very sort of detailed um, strategy. I was a participant in making this strategy. Um, and it, it, it was just very convincing that if, if we just follow this pathway, it, it would work. And I think that level of detail for me is, is, is very kind of um, useful um, because it helps me visualize, you know, what's going to happen and, and, and where I can get to. So that was the first part. The second part, I think, was implementation and you know, actually doing the execution. So doing the tutoring, SAT tutoring, subject tutoring, um, discussing ideas for essays, all of, all of these kinds of things. Um, that was like you mentioned, hundreds of hours um, of work. And, you know, that basically helped me, um, you know, actually execute on the strategy we had set out. So these two things together um, were really just instrumental in, in, in you know, helping me achieve the, the kind of college outcomes I, I, I had. You know, I, I, I attribute, you know, a lot of my success to that because had I not had that insight, um, I don't think I, I would have even attempted, uh, attempted that process. Now, one thing that I, I think was always really exciting about your journey is that you know, we sat together and brainstormed big game plans like taking six A levels, self-studying subjects, doing a lot of these NCQA scholarship exams. And some students back away from the challenge, but you really rose to the occasion. Describe to me a bit, a bit about your psychology in terms of 
initially the idea of kind of stretching well beyond what your classmates were doing, um, you know, how you felt it was possible. And, you know, that sort of blind faith slash conviction in yourself that you could pull this off, which you did to an incredible level. Um, give us that background. Yeah. Uh, so immediately prior to meeting you, actually, I, I, I think the reason I, I found out about Crimson was I was a participant in the Cambridge Learner Awards for IGCSE subjects. And I, I pulled off some pretty decent results. I was first in New Zealand across, first equal in New Zealand across five IGCSE subjects and ha had you know one top in the world, one top in New Zealand award in addition to that too. So that was the first time I realized I could perform at this high level um, sort of nationally. Uh, and I think that gave me a lot of conviction when I met you as the sort of perfect storm of hey, you can follow this really kind of ambitious strategy of taking all these different subjects. And I, although I hadn't considered it previously, I, I, I kind of felt as though I had the ability to do that given the previous results I, I, I had achieved. I also just viewed it as um, you know, a pretty cost-free strategy. Like we could give it a try and if things became too overwhelming, you know, we could cut back. And I believe we actually did that a little bit. So there were, you know, we, we were very ambitious in all these subjects. Um, and then there were some that, you know, were just a little bit too far beyond like my, my capacity. And it was very easy just to move them back. Um, and you know, it ended up ended up working really well. Well said, love it. Okay. Now fast forward to the actual decision, right? So you're in a unique position that few people really in the world, uh, have, and you know, we see thousands of kids, hundreds getting into the Ivy league per year, but it is very rare to be in the situation you're in with five Ivy league offers and, um, Stanford and a full scholarship to Duke. Um, what was the decision making process like? And how did you narrow down the options and what did you ultimately um, decide on in terms of Harvard and why? So so immediately I narrowed my options um, down to three schools, Harvard, Stanford, and University of Pennsylvania for the Huntsman program. And these are the schools I, I, I visited the campuses of, um, you know, prior to you know making this decision. I will say it was very difficult for me to narrow these options down. Um, you know, uh, I think the reason Harvard prevailed in the end was it had just been my childhood obsession really and i felt like you know there was nothing really that was distinguishing be uh, between these schools like based on the visits that i you know made and the people i had spoken to they were all just epic perhaps Wharton was a bit more niche and i was a bit sort of hesitant to um you know pursue this more niche interest um and harvard and stanford had a bit more optionality but between them it was it was very difficult to distinguish so i just went with what um you know what i wanted to do as a kid um and you know i'm glad i did amazing now you spent some time working for Bridgewater, one of the world's biggest hedge funds. And I was curious, you know, from startups to colossal organizations like Bridgewater, actually, re I recently read a book about Bridgewater, actually, written by the Wall Street, one of the Wall Street Journal reporters, very interesting, on the culture of Bridgewater. Reflections on that organization, um, how did you see one of these large corporate kind of hedge fund machines? Any surprising takes? What was your instincts about that environment? I think the most impactful learning from that experience was um, there are, there really are organizations that operate at an elite level, like, you know, it's, it's not as though every organization has some amount of bloat or something like that. There are organizations where there are teams that are very elite. And I think Bridgewater does a good job at cultivating these kinds of teams in both investment associate roles, but also in tech, which is what I was working in. And the way they kind of continue to sustain this culture is, is you know, as you may have mentioned or may have read, um, uh, through this culture of radical transparency where, uh, you know, uh, team members are encouraged um, and, you know, and it almost mandated really to provide critical feedback of their peers um, con uh, continuously. Uh, and that was very interesting for me to see. You know, I had played competitive sports um, back in high school. And so I understood what it was like to be in a very competitive environment, but I had not experienced that in a corporate setting. Um, so it was very interesting to see that that level of excellence exists. And I think that's uh, just a good reference point to have um, that helps me understand, you know, what kind of people I want to work around in the future and, and, and what kind of teams I really want to be a part of as well. Um, so I thought that was, that was, that was very interesting. Fascinating. Okay. And then you took the plunge into on, in the world of entrepreneurship uh, and went on to raise a huge amount of venture capital. Many of our young students look up to you and your story and it's made international headlines recently. Any words of wisdom you would share with a aspiring founder, thinking about the journey, thinking about capital raising, thinking about the early stage you know, that first sort of one year of the adventure, um, what insights would you share? I think uh, you need to find the intersection between what you truly feel interested in and passionate about and um, what is very valuable to, you know, customers. So if you find that intersection, that is what you should work on. You should not work on anything else. I think if you work on problems that are 
you know, passion projects, but don't have great sort of market pull, that's, uh, you know, it's sort of a death trap that you don't want to go down. Similarly, if you, if you work on something that is, you know, very potentially very valuable, but you're not interested in it, it's just so time consuming and, and, and challenging to, you know, get these things really moving, um, and raising capital and all these other things that, uh, you know, you may lack the impetus to go ahead and do that. So, um, it's really about finding that nice intersection between what's going to be valuable and, and what you're really interested in, you know, almost everybody I've met who has achieved that has had, you know, some, uh, like very decent level of success. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's, that would be my, my one learning if I had to impart one learning. Incredible. And, you know, what advice would you give to a 15 year old today watching this video from a far flung part of the world, or maybe in a state or a school in the U S who doesn't have that many students applying to the Ivy league? What would be your advice for them? I would say, uh, you should rigorously study uh, the profiles of you know, um, people who you may know or me even don't know, um, maybe they're from your region or, or nearby who have, who have had success in this application process. Um, similarly, you know, I, I would actually give the same advice to people in college um, studying, uh, you know, professionals who have had great trajectories that they admire. Um, I think, you know, you can gain a lot from analyzing these kind of um, strategies that people have taken. That is something that, you know, you can do through uh, a company like Crimson. And it's kind of wild because you're one of our first students to gain admission to the Ivy League. And just a couple of days ago, we passed 1,000 Ivy League offers, which is pretty epic. Um, so looking back, what do you think was the most valuable part of the Crimson education experience for you? Crimson giving me a really awesome and realistic, achievable vision for how to get into Harvard, Stanford, and all these other Ivy League schools. You know, I think that moment of inspiration that Crimson provided me, obviously backed up by great execution as well, um, was the sort of pivotal changing point, like turning point in my life that led me to go to the US. Um, I think, you know, I'm somebody who really craves that, who really needs this kind of vision to aspire towards. Um, and Crimson just did a phenomenal job at providing that to me. Um, and that really motivated me to follow through on the strategy because I knew exactly where we were going and exactly how we we're going to achieve these results. I think without that clarity, it's very difficult to execute um, like a strategy to get into these, get into these goals. Um, and so you really need a partner that uh, can give you that clarity. It can help you achieve it. Um, and that is very context dependent. So Crimson provided this to me, um, really, uh, in the context of where I was, um, in, you know, my high school life, where I lived, what I already achieved. Um, and so that was, I think the most valuable part. Incredible, incredible. And Samir is too humble to share this, but he is currently making some serious international headlines. So if you were inspired by some of his words today, I encourage you to check out some of this content, which is really covering his amazing company and what he's up to next in the world of AI, which we'll be following very eagerly. Thanks so much for joining us, Samuel. I appreciate it. See you soon, mate. All right. Thanks, Jamie.